The following is a local resident producer's program. The program content is the sole responsibility of the producer and does not necessarily reflect the views or policies of CATV2, Oshkosh Community Media Services, the City of Oshkosh, or Time Warner Cable. Hi everybody, welcome to Ion Oshkosh. Cheryl Hentz and Dan Rylance here and uh, pleased to welcome back to the show the managing editor of the Oshkosh Northwestern, Jim Fitzhenry. Uh, we're going to be talking tonight uh, a lot about uh, last week's election and um, then some other things going on at the Oshkosh Northwestern and their their blogs and, and what have you. So anyway, thanks for being yeah, here again. Welcome, we appreciate Jim. it very much. Yeah. Um, well, we do want to certainly touch on the election and I'll, I'll just disclose right up front I, I'm still trying to process and catch up on all the election stuff. I was gone on vacation, completely out of the country, and didn't have access to news or anything, so I'm still trying to catch up on things. So um, Dan may be leading the way here on a lot of this, but um, uh, one thing, when, when we first asked you to come on, you had said um, that after the election, we'd know whether there's been a restoration of the republic or a doom of the democracy. So. What do you think? <laughs> <laughs> Let's just charge yeah, yeah, into you that right us. off the bat. Yeah, good. <laughs> well, I think that uh, in the time you missed, you didn't miss anything much with the television ads and the negativity. Oh, I saw and plenty the, of those the, before I left. <laughs> the, the basic tone and tenor of the political ads was kind of that fatalistic, what's going to happen, what's going to you know, be, uh, be the outcome of it. Um, I think that was just kind of uh, poking fun at... Uh, the stakes in the election and how people were conducting their campaigns, that it wasn't uh, a discussion about who has the best ideas to run government, who has the plans to do things, to turn things around. It was more or less an Armageddon type feeling that you had from watching the TV ads. Yeah. And so um, the day after the election, we woke up, the sun came out, and we still had the same problems. We have a lot of new faces of trying to solve the problems. So. Um, you know, not really a solid answer for you there on that part of it. Well, I think it's going to be interesting. You know, I mean, I was actually kind of glad. It, I, I told Dan before I left, I said, you know, it's having lived through this for months <laughs> and, and enduring all the ads like everybody else, I was almost not going to, you know, um, be happy about not being able to know who won and who lost. But I have to say, being away from it, for a week was really, really nice, you know, so. You were lucky. Yeah, yeah, too bad I couldn't have avoided all the negative campaigning yeah. prior to that, yeah. but go ahead. Um, my background is history, and, and historians try to measure change, you know, and, and what do you think? How much change and how much continuity do you think was nationally in the election? Well, I think you just have some basic numbers of things that change, and the House of Representatives okay. is going to have a new majority leader. Republicans are in control there. Uh, in state government, it was a, a complete change that uh, two years ago we had a Democratic governor and a Democratic legislature. Now it's the complete opposite, right. where Republicans have a, a very sizable majority in the state assembly right. and the state senate and a governor. So you just have two very different parties, different platforms who are going to be there. So there's, there's change in that. Okay. What kind of change we see in, in the state or the country is something that's going to be determined, but just from sheer numbers and parties in control, there was a huge change, okay. um, especially here in Wisconsin. Okay. Some continuity in the Senate remaining Democrat, although they lost seats, they still do control the U.S. Senate. 
Uh, that was huge for Democrats. I mean, okay, it was yeah. huge that they have that majority there, that uh, there, there will be a place where legislation that the House is going to pass is going to be debated, it's going to be slowed down, it's going to be changed, right. it's going to be amended. Um, it's certainly not close to the 60 vote majority that they had early on, but certainly enough to, uh, to, to really force Republicans to do some compromising right. on legislation. Right. And conference committee is going to be a, a big uh, issue as, you know, House Republicans are eager to show that they ran on a platform, right. much like uh, 1990 form, that they're going to put in place the things that they spelled out that they would do. So I think that uh, the, the Senate is going to be where quite a bit of action is. Of course, the Senate was dysfunctional for the last two years mm -hmm. with a larger Democratic control. And, and you know, one of the winners in the Senate called Senator DeMint from South Carolina, who is you know, one of the more obnoxious, non-participating members, even to his own party. And the guy said, well, Senator DeMint, what, what committees? do you think I should sign up for? DeMint said, the hell with the committees? He said, we just stop everything on the floor. Um, and that's basically what the Republicans have been doing in the Senate for, for two years with 41 votes, or sometimes less than 41 votes because two or three Democrats, you know, go with the Republicans. So uh, I, I don't know what's going to happen in the lame duck session, but... Uh, see. Um, was this a disaster for the president, this election? Um, I think uh, perception-wise it was mm -hmm. a disaster. When you think about 2008, when you think about the resounding majorities that the Democratic Party had, um, I don't think it's a disaster historically in that presidents in power right. typically lose votes in a midterm election. Uh, we haven't seen from that disaster, which for more than a month was forecast to happen. It was uh, the, the way it was reported and the storyline was disaster for Democrats is that there hasn't been uh, a really strategy from the White House to counter that. They knew it was coming, they could see it, the polls showed it, the polls were pretty consistent with that and that there really hasn't been a response that uh, there's a strategy to counter it, that there's a strategy to uh, get out of it sort of reflects Obama's general response to things that he you know he gives these nice speeches but he doesn't really come in with something really hard like the last two weeks of the campaign all they were doing is complaining about all this foreign money that was coming in that was undisclosed and I remember uh, Bob Schieffer on CBS asked uh, uh, Axelrod one of his leading he said is this the best you can do I mean, you know, this is the election a week or two, and this is all I hear you saying. Is this, is well, this the, the fact that David <coughs> Axelrod continues to be a leading spokesman for the administration points out one of the chief problems that Obama has had is that most of his inner circle from Chicago is still intact mm -hmm. and still in place. And they ran a great campaign in 2008. Do you remember the John McCain ad where they talked about Obama being a celebrity and he was like Paris Hilton? Um, you know, you have a president who's still very much running a campaign and not running a country, I think would be the, the biggest yeah. critique that you would have. Mm -hmm. And uh, he hasn't brought a lot of seasoned Washington people into his administration who could help him make that transition. He's got a very close inner circle of people from Chicago who are still advising him, still doing that. And I think that's why the administration continues to struggle. Kind of like the Carter years with the boys from Georgia who had basically no experience in government and very close-knit and made a lot of mistakes that cost him a second term in part for the presidency. Yeah. Um, uh, one thing that I was reading, Jim, before the election um, was that nationally at least women were going to be the swing vote in this election. Um, do you think that that you know, prediction held true? Um, it did turn out in the numbers. If you'll note here in, in Wisconsin, uh, some of one of Senator Feingold's last ads featured all women talking about mm -hmm. his campaign and his candidacy, and it was a huge swing vote that uh, Republicans were able to capture this time around. So it definitely hurt the Democratic Party that they, they couldn't convince women to vote for them, who had came out in 2008 in great numbers for Democrats. Yeah. And uh, it was another core weakness, and, and independents were 
the largest swing vote okay. in this election away yeah. from Democrats yeah. in 2008. What about the, the youth vote? You know, we saw Gordon Hintz and, and Russ Feingold spend a fair amount of time on campus here, and I'm sure that was true of, of other mm -hmm. lawmakers in other parts of the country. Um, you know, did, did the youth make a difference at all in this vote? It doesn't really seem like it. Uh, they stayed home. That's how yeah. they made a difference. Yeah. Um, it, it's hard to get uh, young voters out for midterm elections. Um, they came out in mass in 2008. There were a couple of very large rallies on campus. We had uh, uh, Senator, then Senator Obama came, yeah. Pat Kolf, uh John Kerry came mm -hmm. and gave a speech at UW Oshkosh. It was well attended and they marched a large group of students down to do early voting. And uh, we had done a couple of news stories on rallies that uh, Senator Feingold had and I think uh, a couple of days before election day, there had only been like 15 or 16 students who had actually voted. Huh. So that's a pretty stunning number and a pretty big turnaround, which um, the, the separation between Senator Feingold and Ron Johnson was about 100,000 votes and uh, just didn't pick up the youth vote. Yeah. That's a good question. Nationally, 16% of the youth voted in the presidential election two years ago. Only 11% voted this time. Yeah. Um, well, go ahead. Yeah. Let's talk a little bit about uh, the Tea Party. Uh, clearly a, a factor in the election. Um, what, what's your impressions of it? I, I, I mean, it's, it's not a monolithic one thing, but if you look back on it, uh, what does the Tea Party mean to you? Um, that, that's a really broad topic because the Tea Party is a really diverse group it of is. people. Um, by definition, there's not a Tea Party platform right. or plank. Uh, it's going to mean different things to different people. I know that here in Wisconsin that the Tea Party um, wasn't that distinct and separate from the Republican Party. Uh, when you look at what happened in that Madison Tea Party when uh, former Governor Thompson announced he wasn't going to be running for the Senate, um, Oshkosh's Ron Johnson gave a very well-delivered uh, well speech there that really launched his campaign. Um, that was a Tea Party slash Republican Party rally. And throughout American history, Dan, you know this better than mm -hmm. I do, most third party movements have generally been um, taken into one of the parties, has mm -hmm. picked it up and, and adopted their plank. So I think in this case, the, uh, the Tea Party has been more Republican. Mm -hmm. And uh, we're going to find out here over the next couple of months of how much the Republicans are changing mm -hmm and how much Tea Party is changing Republicans. I think that's and a really good, yeah. How do the Mama Grizzlies do in this election? Um, some of the Mama Grizzlies won and some of them lost. I mean, it was, uh, you know, obviously in uh, Christine O'Donnell was a very high profile case. Right. Um, somebody is going to use the uh, witch ad is going to be the, uh, the most memorable thing 100 <laughs> years from now yep. from this election. That's going to be the thing that people are going to remember. No historian will be able to pass up a, a joke of that, a quip of that, or something of that. Of when you think about all of the, the fundamental issues facing our country, uh, people are going to remember, I'm not a witch. <laughs> all right, then. <laughs> Did you have anything else on well, the Tea What party? are the Democrats going to do? I, I, I keep thinking that they ought to need, have a Tea Party movement within the Democratic Party. <laughs> um, you know, there are a lot of things that, you know, I'm not for the war in Afghanistan. Um, I was for a single payer for health care. Uh, I don't want offshore drilling for oil. Those are things that, that I thought Obama was going to move forward with. And he hasn't moved forward with any of those. And so I'm, I'm wondering, you know, uh, whether we need to push a Tea Party within the Democratic Party to, to push you know, further to what I thought were main Democratic issues. You know, uh, I think a lot of this stems from the 2008 election. Um, when you look at what happened there, um, it was more of, I'm not George Bush. Mm -hmm. George Bush was so very deeply unpopular that, uh, you know, there wasn't a whole lot of thought given to what Democrats were actually going to do when they got in power. And I know that, that uh, some Democrats might take issue with me with that. Mm -hmm. But uh, if you look at the 2008 campaign and you look at um, President Obama's campaign, you know, there was a, a whole lot of, uh, you know, it was an excellent campaign, a well-run campaign, but, you know, I don't think people hope and change, what, you know, what does that mean? 
And uh, I think that it was sold brilliantly. And uh, I think that when people examined it and looked at the record of what happened, they didn't feel like they had hope and change. Mm -hmm. And uh, I think that's the biggest issue for Democrats mm -hmm. is getting back to what the fundamentals are for them and, and their basics. But, uh, you know, I, I think that right now um, they're still in defensive. Mm -hmm. Two of the big things that, that we heard being harped on during this campaign, um, on you know both the, the Senate uh, race uh, between Feingold and, and Johnson, but it, it nationally overall, were you know health care reform and the, the bailouts, the stimulus, and, and that kind of thing. Well, obviously, the bailouts are done. The stimulus money has has you know been applied for and distributed, but the health care reform, that's that's something that even though that passed, do you see that possibly as you know, a strong movement to undo that. I, I, I think we're probably going to see that, but if we do, how long do you think it's going to take to undo it, or can it be undone? Well, I think for the next two years, you've got a, a presidential veto, and you've got a Democratic majority in the Senate, which is going to be able to thwart that. Mm -hmm. um, I think that the disconnect that happened on health care was that when you had a president take office, when there was almost an economic collapse, which uh, which seems to be a consensus there. I think the only number that really mattered for Barack Obama was the unemployment rate. Mm -hmm. And I think that when the Democrats took their eyes off of the unemployment rate and put it on satisfying or, or actually getting that one goal that had been uh, long a dream for Democrats and liberals of yeah. uh, health care, that's when they began to see their downfall happen. Mm -hmm. And if you go, if you trace through um, the first town hall meetings where you had that uh, complete uprising of people okay. talking about health care, the anger, the frustration, um, I think that's where you could see things starting to come off the tracks mm -hmm. of focusing on that. It doesn't mean that health care isn't important. It doesn't mean that it isn't fundamental. But I think for most voters and most Americans, they cared about unemployment and the economy. Yeah. And I think that uh, there wasn't a really good job of explaining what it was that health care was, what they were trying to do. And you remember the political process of the senator from Nebraska who was negotiating the deal with that. That, that just enraged a lot of people and made them think, this whole process is corrupt. This whole process is not looking out for me. And I think that, uh, you know, uh, I think for traditional Democrats and liberals, they celebrated we finally got health care passed, but that's when they lost yeah. because they weren't able to explain and uh, I think that when you look at some of the fundamentals of that that are very popular, mm -hmm. of uh, no lifetime cap on benefits of children with pre-existing conditions, Democrats like Russ Feingold couldn't even win on that because I think people were so skeptical of it. Sure. And I think the fact that anytime you want to create a whole new federal bureaucracy and a set of rules, I think we should all take pause at that yeah. and uh, just look at the TSA, look at the Department of Homeland Security um, as a cautionary of giant new federal bureaucracies. Nobody mm -hmm. thinks that that's worked well, and uh, that was something that was passed under a Republican president and a Republican Congress. Well, you know, uh, still on the subject of, of Barack Obama and national politics, you know, I, I don't recall ever seeing a nation get so upset so soon with a president. You know, um, and maybe it's happened and I'm just not recalling it, but I, I can't recall it. I mean, they were upset with Obama after he was only in office a, a year, maybe even just a little bit less, saying he's not delivering on his promises, he's not doing this, he's not doing that. Well, it takes time to, to especially when you've inherited eight years of problems plus, you know, and the man can't do everything in a year. It can't even be done in a four-year term, <laughs> you know. So are, are people being, are, are we just as a country so frustrated with everything that he's getting the bulk of our angst? I think that some of the expectations were unfair and some of the anger that was directed at him, and that's a really complex issue of how people feel about an African-American president. Um, uh, on the religious questions of whether or not he's a Muslim or a Christian. 
I think that, that that's been an issue that some of yeah. his uh, opponents have, have used to their advantage. I just don't think that beyond the campaign itself, he's connected with people. He doesn't have um, a, a warm touch for people. And I think that um, that has been the, the primary thing that's dogged him. Um, I think that uh, when you look at the, the, the classic things of Franklin Roosevelt was in a worse situation and people gave him more time because he gave people uh, uh, hope. And I think that <clears throat> because the 2008 campaign had such heightened expectations, mm -hmm. if you think about his uh, speech in Grant Park, it was almost somber. Yeah. And everything has been almost somber. And I don't think he's done a very good job of being the uh, head of government. We know that he's the president and he's the chief executive, but you know, the American presidency is two components. You have the chief of state, and I don't think he's done a very good job of being the head of the government and being a symbol of the country that okay. way. And I don't think he's come across <clears throat> as... Yeah. Oddly, uh, on the foreign scene, he's incredibly well-liked. Uh, he has, early in his presidency, he had all these town hall meetings with students from Germany and other places. Open mic, they could ask whatever they wanted to. You know, what a change from, from the previous president. Mm -hmm. And so he's incredibly, he's intelligent, which I think the foreign press uh, didn't feel the prior president was, at least he wasn't very good uh, vocabulary and speaking. Why He's really liked, he's, our, our, our image abroad is much better than it probably is at well, home. I don't think yeah. it, it helped the president to get the Nobel Peace Prize. I no, mean, I, I, th I think no. for a lot of people that solidified the feeling that this was not substance, yeah. that it was, he was uh, a celebrity. Yeah. And uh, when you get, when you think about the people who've been awarded the That's Nobel true. Peace Prize, it, just for not being George Bush. Yeah. That's what it was. <laughs> yeah. Um, let, let's go to Wisconsin. Um, um, is there anything Russ Feinkold could have done based on your writing and research that, that he could have beat Ron Johnson? Um, in, in July, the, uh, the Northwestern ran a story from our Washington Bureau, um, and they were talking to people from the Cook Political Report mm -hmm. who were talking about the political environment. And uh, if you look back on that story, it, it pegged it. It said, Russ Feingold can do everything right and still lose the election. Um, it was uh, a perfect storm, and that's mm -hmm. kind of a cliche of, of mm -hmm. elements that hit him. Um, you know, you can't underplay the, uh, the, the, the really, and I wrote a column about it, the brilliance of Ron Johnson's campaign. Yeah. Um, they, they ran a great campaign. Ron was the right type of person at the, at the right time. Um, talked about the issues that really were on the minds of people. And I think the, the feeling was that we need to just get the people who've been in there out of office and start with something fresh. It doesn't ever explain Tom Petri. Mm -hmm. um, because that would be a natural follow-up question of, yeah. um, you know, Russ Feingold was a career politician, but Tom Petri was, a, was an elder statesman, uh, not a career politician, mm -hmm. and, and he'd been in office longer. Mm -hmm. um, but I think that, uh, you know, Ron Johnson was, uh, w w was just ran a great campaign. If someone other than Ron Johnson, I don't have any names, was Johnson the perfect candidate to beat him? Other candidates might not have, or it wouldn't have made any difference. Um, I think Ron Johnson was the perfect candidate to beat him. I mean, if if you're if the uh, a lot of times campaigns come down to what is the basic question that you're asking. If the basic question of the 2010 campaign is who is the best person to improve the economy, is it somebody who spent 18 years in Washington and couldn't get the job done, or should we give somebody like Ron Johnson? who is the antithesis of a career politician, of somebody who ran a business successfully, was uh, involved in the community. Uh, you know, if that was the, the question from the beginning, Russ Feingold couldn't win that argument. My, my, well, I've got a lot of problems with Ron Johnson. <laughs> but I think one of the biggest is the same problem that a lot of people had, and that was that he offered no real answers to anything. He just simply refused to 
give his ideas and his plans. He just kept saying the same old stuff over and over again. He was very inaccessible to local media. Um, you folks had a problem with him. We had a problem. We made four different attempts to get him on this show. And I don't care if somebody comes on the show or not. I, I think it's dumb to pass up an opportunity for free press, but whatever. But what I really had an issue with with regard to our invitations was they didn't even have the common courtesy to return a phone call and say no. And that to me, when someone's extending you an invitation, common courtesy requires that you at least say thank you but we can't or no thanks or whatever. That was an issue mm -hmm. uh, f for me. Um, but you know, he just offered no answers and yet people voted him in. I don't understand that. Um, I, I think it, uh, it just, you know, Ron had the ability to self-finance much of his campaign. Mm -hmm. um, he ran a steady stream of television commercials, and uh, in a low turnout election, um, that's a winning mm -hmm. strategy. Um, I think that a lot of times the, the TV ads, especially the negative ads, suppress people from even coming out to vote because they don't feel like they can vote somebody in who's good that they feel positive about. Yeah. Um, I, I think that time is going to tell what the fruits of that strategy are for actually governing mm -hmm. and doing the type of things mm -hmm. you need to do to get support of a broad base of people for your ideas and your policies. Sure. Um, it, it, ran, it won the campaign and I think that that's the only question that the, the, the Johnson campaign thought of. Johnson, the senator, we're going to find out mm -hmm. quickly of, of what his uh, views are and... And, uh, and what his abilities are. You know, I think yeah. he's going to find those waters a lot harder to navigate than he probably thinks. Um, you know, I mean, he is a freshman senator coming in and he's not just... His money can't buy change in the Senate. <coughs> it maybe bought him a seat or helped to buy him a seat, but it's not going to buy change. Jim, who do you think really ran his campaign? Were these... I mean, who, who were the, I mean, he clearly, this businessman didn't come up with this, did he, by himself? Who do you think ran his campaign? Um, Justin Johnson was his campaign manager. Okay. Um, and where does that come from, that name? Is that, he did other campaigns? He has done other campaigns. He worked with uh, Attorney General Van Hollen's campaigns. Okay. Um, clearly, very early on, R Ron brought in some very experienced okay. and, and very good campaign okay. people. Um, uh, he did an interview in uh, May or June with the Rock River Patriots, a Tea Party group. Okay. It was a YouTube video, <laughs> and uh, it got him into some trouble for making some comments extemporaneously that he wouldn't want to make. Is that the Sunspot thing, or? No, the Sunspot was at the Milwaukee Journal Sentinel's okay. editorial <laughs> Okay, sorry. <laughs> um, <laughs> but the, the campaign made a decision very early on that um, he wasn't a trained politician, mm -hmm. he hadn't gone through the talking points, that he, they were going to limit the access and availability to him because it was a potential liability, because he wasn't a polished person, mm -hmm. because he hadn't gone through years of knocking on doors, mm -hmm. years of doing meetings and, and doing that, um, that they made a determination, this is just my view, sure. they made a determination that um, they didn't want to get him on camera and have him make a gaffe that would be replayed over and over again in an attack ad. Mm -hmm. And uh, the one fine gold ad that really, really made a big dent in closing the numbers was the, uh, the ad on uh, the uh, creative destruction. Mm -hmm. okay. and, and if you looked at the polls and you looked at the impact that ad had, and that was one of the few gaffes that Ron made outside of the sunspots. Mm -hmm. mm -hmm on the campaign trail. So um, they, they limited access to him. They, uh, they, all their appearances were very carefully planned. Um, you know, he didn't go press the flesh like mm -hmm. some candidates love to do. Mm -hmm. um, so yeah, I mean, they, they, they ran their campaign intelligently. Have you had lunch with him since the, uh, his victory? No, I haven't. No. no. <laughs> Okay. What What is the Northwestern, I mean, I, you, this is, but I mean, he is elected from Oshkosh. You are the daily newspaper in Oshkosh, and he's kind of ignored you. What What are you going to do with him, and what do you think he's going to do with you? 
Um, our editorial board meets every Tuesday at noon. Okay. Any Tuesday any that Tuesday. Uh, <laughs> Senator Johnson would like to come in and have a, a civil and spirited okay. discussion of the issues, we'd, we'd love to have him in. Okay. Um, I, I think that wh when he made his acceptance speech at EAA, he said he understood he was everybody's senator. And uh, okay. I think, w take him at his word, that he is going to work in the best interests of everybody uh, in the state. But what do you think, um, and again, this is just your own speculation, but what do you think his accessibility will be for his constituents? He wasn't very accessible um, to would-be constituents or the media prior to the election. Um, what do you think it'll be now that he's a senator-elect? Um, I think he will continue with his basic strategy mm -hmm. until mm -hmm. he's got to do something else. Mm -hmm. um, I, I, mean, I think they, they, they came through the campaign thinking that... Uh, um, they were able to limit the number of debates with uh, Senator Feingold, who's uh, a brilliant debater. Mm -hmm. They were able to get away with three debates. Yep. Um, the only debate where there was an actual debate was in Wausau, which was uh, one of the debates that Gannett Wisconsin Media was a co-sponsor of. The other two debates were basically television debates. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, there wasn't any exchange of issues. So, um, you know, they're, they're thinking, we got our candidate elected by a pretty substantial majority. We knocked out a three-term incumbent. They're thinking, what do they have to change? Mm -hmm. yeah. um, do you know whether he's going to have an office in Oshkosh? I don't know. Mm -hmm. Give him a call. Give him a call. I'm sure he'll respond. A couple things <laughs> on, on the race that I found out that, and, and polls are, you know, everyone is different, but one of the polls I read is that Feingold, or Obama's popularity in Wisconsin had dropped the most of any state in the Union, which clearly did not help Feingold. Uh, I, I just thought that was an interesting statistic. Huh. Uh, don't know why exactly, but uh, you know he, that made it harder, I think, for him to, to have a chance as well. Sure. So, yeah. Do you want to talk about uh, the governor's race? Sure. Or Let's did you have anything else yet on No, I, I just race? read one thing where it said that, you know, this was an election where you'd even vote your mother out of office, especially if she was a Democrat. And I think in some ways that, that happened in a lot of places. Yeah. Um, no, let's go on to the governor's race. Um, Barrett's situation, same as, as, as Feingold's? That, is there anything Tom Barrett could have done to win the election? Um, uh, not unless he was prepared to really make a sharp differentiation between him and Governor Doyle. He really got stuck with that, didn't he? Um, well, it's, it's kind of like 1968 of yeah. Humphrey and Johnson. Yeah. Um, you know, there wasn't really a lot of distinction for people mm -hmm. between that. And I think that, uh, you know, Scott Walker ran in the Republican primary four years earlier against Mark Green. Um, he bowed out of that and said it's Mark Green's time to do this. Mm -hmm. But, you know, he had been laying the groundwork for this campaign since then. And uh, I don't think that uh, un unless Tom Barrett was really going to come out and do something substantively different, mm -hmm. uh, that he had a chance to win that mm -hmm. race. Now, unlike Johnson, we do know a lot about Scott Walker because he was quite specific in this campaign about the things that he's going to do. Maybe we could talk a little bit about one of the, some sure. of the things that he's going to do. Uh, like what? <laughs> He wants to, uh, doesn't want to do the rail. That's yeah, been the high-speed rail is, uh, that's, is one that's Although been he was told em emphatically weeks. that he can't use the money for something else, so whether he's still hanging on that, but he wants to renegotiate that. But my guess is unless they use the money for that, it'll, I guess Como in New York has already called and asked for the money, so he probably won't stay in Wisconsin. But, uh, well, one thing that's uh, that has the potential to affect hundreds of thousands of people is is badger care right. you know he has really come out strong um, in opposition to to that not as a whole concept but he wants to make some changes to that um, who who's going to be targeted as potential losers in that if he does successfully make some changes there to that program I think it would just be speculation of exactly what uh, what he might cut and what he would do with that. Um, I think at this point in time, uh, you know, the budget projections come out every couple of weeks. It seems like the budget deficit is a little bit higher. Mm -hmm. um, so I, I think it'd be hard to say exactly up front, uh, you know, 
during the campaign, he talked quite a bit about asking state employees okay. to kick in a, more of a share of their health insurance and pensions. Okay. Um, I think that that's a place where he's going to start. Um, when he visited with the Northwestern's editorial board, um, he talked about um, you know more specific areas that he would do of uh, changing collective bargaining laws. Um, when it pertains to teachers, of reimposing the qualified economic offer, of uh, <clears throat> when teacher contracts, if they would go to arbitration. Uh, one of the issues now is that the, uh, in arbitration, <coughs> they cannot take a look at what the local economic conditions are. They can only look at comparable districts and how they've settled. And uh, if arbitration laws are changed, uh, there would be perhaps lower settlements for teacher contracts and things like that. Uh, Do you have any sense, and this is really early I know, but you know, is the Republican legislature both in the Assembly and the Senate just going to bow and, and whatever Scott Walker wants he's going to get? Or do we have any sense of that? Uh, <clears throat> I think in, in large part that's going to depend on um, how strong of a governor they perceive him to be. Um, even though they're from the same party, you're going to have uh, you know, individual legislators who, who might want specific pieces of legislation. We're going to find that out pretty quickly of, of how many social issues come on the legislature's uh, agenda, conceal and carry, uh, stem cell research, things like that. You're going to Domestic um, partnership. Domestic partnerships. Um, you're you're going to get a sense of where the party is going and, and what Walker's role in that is. Um, I, I think that Walker has spoken consistently about about the economy and jobs and getting that going again. I would get a sense that somebody who talks about a brown bag movement and running government more efficiently doesn't really want to get into some of those social issues that have proven to be very, very decisive divisive, excuse me. <laughs> um, so we're going to get a sense of that, of uh, how much of, how many of those individual pieces of legislation are pushed through early <coughs> in the session, how much, uh, how much the, the legislature is going to focus in on the budget and the deficit and uh, state government. Did you understand, either of you, how he was going to give this huge tax break on the one hand and eliminate the deficit? And, and bring the budget back. So I didn't get it. No. <clears throat> if I put two glasses of water here and pull the thing out, I, yeah, I mean, that's one of the questions that we yeah. had for him at, at the editorial board. We met with him uh, twice. We mm -hmm. met with him early in the spring. We had quite a discussion about that, mm -hmm. of, um, of the way the economic theory goes, that if you get people hiring, if you get jobs created, if you get economic activity, you could see how in the long term that would get the budget back into balance because you'd have more revenue coming in. Um, but the question is that in that short term period where you give those tax cuts and you deprive yourself of the revenue of how do you get the budget balanced and that's the big question. What do you say? Um, he, How's he going to do that? Personally for me he didn't have a very he convincing didn't have a very argument. Good answer. Okay. Um, Okay. But, but I think that w what he would say in his defense is that, you know, they're going to be looking at making strategic cuts in the budget, okay. that they're going to look for ways to eliminate inefficiencies and okay. eliminate waste and, uh, you know, take a look at programs and things like the adult portion of Badger Care okay. that didn't include children, um, asking government workers to kick in more of their health insurance and pensions. Um, that, that's part of what we're going to find out mm -hmm. of taking the art of the campaign mm -hmm. into the art of governing. Yeah. And, uh, Clearly that 4,000 positions that are vacant mm -hmm. uh, are not, it's not going to bring us back into a balance. I mean, he's got to go deeper than that. Well, I think that uh, the, the president of the Senate, uh, state Senate, is now Senator Mike Ellis. Right. And, uh, you know, he's been a, a budget hawk. Mm -hmm. Um, he's been somebody who's talked quite a bit about eliminating the structural deficit. And it'll be interesting to see if, if uh, Senator Ellis has a prominent voice, um, there will be fundamental changes in budgeting. Okay, now we look at the budget. If he's going to go after, I mean, what are we going to do with foundation aid to public schools and what are we going to do with the UW system? And what are we going to do with uh, corrections? I mean, if we put those three things on this table, my guess is we're over 50% of the budget. 
Uh, you are in the high 80s. High 80s, like yeah. okay. Yeah, most, so, of, most of the state budget is aids back to, it's for public education, okay. the university system, yeah. yeah and shared revenue we should throw in too. Shared but, revenue. But, man, if he cuts those, then we'll be talking about huge increases in property tax come 12. I mean, if, that, if that's what happens, if he cuts those, then what's the alternative for a local school district, a city, a county? but to raise property taxes. I don't know. But they can only be raised so much unless he changes that. Yeah. Okay. And has enough support to change that. Yeah. Okay. Anything Stay else? tuned. No, I, 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 I can ask questions, but I don't, I don't know any more than that either. Um, go locally a little bit. Um, sure. Gordon Hintz is, I guess, will... Uh, I think his first term in, he was in the minority, and then he was in the majority, so he goes back to the minority again. Mm -hmm. Someone said every, everyone who serves in the legislature ought to serve in the minority at least once. For him, it'll be now twice. <laughs> but, uh, I mean, he's, uh, he seems to be a, a sort of a moderate Democrat that probably uh, will work uh, you know, as he has before you know, without power. But, uh, um, well, his re-election really wasn't a surprise, I no, don't think. No, no. <coughs> Can we talk to about Northwestern a little bit? I've got a few questions sure, on sure, Northwestern. Yeah. One thing I really like about the paper is this police report you put in two or three times a week, where you go in and it looks like little raindrops. Uh -huh. So I can do they send that to you, or do you, how do you how do you get the raindrops on the, all of that? Uh, we we try and do that uh, Monday through Friday okay. on the website, and uh, the police department every day puts out just the calls for service on their okay. website. Okay. We take that. Um, we put it into a database program, and somebody then connects that with a map. Okay. So I check that all the time. There are a lot of raindrops in my neighborhood. I mean, <laughs> they really are. I mean, Bowen and Parkway and Monroe and Boyd, I'm thinking, wow, there's 15 <laughs> you know, this day. But it's, it's for, for people who don't know that, I mean, they really should go into the Oshkosh North because it gives you a, a, just a, you know, a, a day thing of where crime is in, in this. I, I think it's a wonderful service. I, I compliment you on that. And it's not it's not major type crime. It's no, I mean, no, no. It, it I'm not saying anything no, no. from no. car accidents yeah. to you know. But you see a lot of raindrops around yeah. your neighborhood, and you're thinking, well, yeah. gee, you know, you know, I, no, I'm, I don't have a gun or anything, but um, <laughs> you know, it, uh, um, <laughs> we're both relieved at this table. Yeah. <laughs> All right, now another question. You know. Every once in a while, not daily, but maybe twice a week, I go in and read the bloggers who respond to your column, your editorials, to letters to the editor, or whatever. And I just find them to be incredibly uncivil, even nasty. And then there's a group of them that I think have breakfast in the morning and then spend the rest of the day fighting each other on what they said an hour before. Um, shouldn't they have to identify their names? Well, that's, that's one of the great questions of our time for, for newspapers okay. and news organizations of whether or not they should have to identify okay. themselves. Uh, one of the things that uh, I think since the last time we talked, um, probably about eight months ago, is that um, our company is contracted with uh, a company to basically monitor the comments 24 hours a day, seven okay. days a week. And uh, during this campaign cycle, um, they've been very aggressive in taking down things that clearly go over the line. Um, there's been a lot of comments removed. There's been some people who've been banished from making comments oh, okay. um, because of that. Uh, on some stories, we uh, don't allow comments on. We've had some uh, crime news where uh, the, the conversation quickly mm -hmm. disintegrates. Um, it, it, it's a huge question mm -hmm. for the newspaper industry. It's a huge question for democracy it of uh, the people's expectations of what they're able to do and comment on on the internet are mm -hmm. different than in the newspaper and letters to the editor and signed uh, columns. Um, but we've been uh, much more aggressive in that. Um, but I, I try and always read those with a grain of salt. Mm -hmm. well, clearly, you. You're the psychologist for 15 or 20 bloggers who daily use this to get rid of their stress and stuff. And there's a lot of stress in their comments. Yeah. And, uh, well, you know, we're fortunate that we've got some people who are pretty active contributors who are civil, mm -hmm. who want to have a discussion about issues. Mm -hmm. um, so it's... Yeah, no, I, I, I see both sides. 
Well, one of the things that you know we've all probably noticed is is that in addition to the the comments that have been removed, um, you know they've <laughs> the comment that's been removed is still in it's still part of another post by someone else, and you look at it. And there seems to be nothing whatsoever wrong with that comment. And I've actually read people saying, hey, there was nothing wrong with that comment at all. So what is it about some of these comments that's obviously in these people's minds over the line? But when we look at it, it, it looks just fine. Um, one of the things that uh, <clears throat> as we've worked, with, worked through some of the you know, looking at a comment and knowing whether it crosses the line is kind of a subjective exercise of, mm -hmm. is it that first push on the playground? Is it that first thing that really sets people off, that stops the conversation from disintegrating? And it's kind of a judgment call of, is that kind of comment just, you know, half a millisecond over the line mm -hmm. that pushes people into more incivility? And is it something that uh, gets the conversation off track and on the side issues, on the personalities, on to things that uh, will basically cause that to break down and not talk about the issue anymore. Mm -hmm. And yet, I've seen on, um, see, I, I think personality is sometimes when you're dealing with politics, it's, it's a necessary evil at times. But one of the things that I saw recently, um, and I, I'm thinking it was on Streetwise's uh, <clears throat> personal column. They got to talking about, um, somehow the discussion ended up being about the Sosnowskis. And I thought that there were some comments, whether they're accurate or not accurate. I think some of them were a little bit over the line and probably inappropriate, and yet they remain on there. Have you seen those? Do you no, know I which have one? Not. Okay. You might that want to check it out. That was about the construction on, on the cinders on North Main, yes, wasn't it? Yes, it that's was. That's where yeah. it started from. Yeah. Yeah. That, that's right. I was yeah. trying to think yep. exactly where, because I saw it and I'm trying yeah. to catch up on everything. Now the whole building is gone. <clears throat> they start over from scratch. I drove by the other day because it's I always... It's down? It's down. That they were starting over. Wow. And, okay. and then they had a sign up there. I think I called Jim on it. It said, work delayed by City Hall. That was up there for And that was the column that started this whole thing. It was, and, and yeah, I just, yeah. You know, they went from that into something else, yeah. even going no, after Carl, Sosna um, uh, Carl Sosnowski's, um, you know, heating and cooling business. And, yeah. you know, was, it, it just seemed like maybe some of this was, I mean, you can't prove that some of these things actually took place. And it just seemed like no matter how a person feels about the Sosnowski family <clears throat> or how they run their businesses, it just seemed to me reading it that mm -hmm. eh, some of those comments were a little bit over the line, more so than some of the things I've actually seen removed. Mm -hmm. And yet those are still there. So. Community journalist on, on your editorial page, clearly the numbers have dropped significantly. You've got you know, four or five that are just stay on the course, but uh, are you going to keep going on that with those, that group, try to find more? Uh, what do it, you do? You mean for uh, community columnists? Community columnists, it's, yeah. it's cyclical. Of yeah, people get excited about it. They want to do it. Um, we go out and recruit a fresh batch of right. people who want to come in. Um, as you know, both Dan and Cheryl, it's kind of hard to write a column and come up <laughs> with ideas and, and do that. So I think a lot of people come in with very high expectations of what they'll be able to yeah, do yeah. and then find out that yeah. it's it's a difficult thing to do especially when you put your name to it or have your your picture associated with it yeah. so it's cyclical yeah. um, I'm sure that we'll get more people who want to come in and contribute to it um, we've had some some really good letters to the editor mm -hmm. on the election we had some people break some new ground one of my favorites is uh, Dick Heron uh, always writes with a very mm -hmm. gentle, humorous touch mm -hmm. of his stuff. Mm -hmm. um, so we look forward to some of our regulars who really bring uh, a nice perspective to that. Now, your column isn't cyclical, is it? No, it is not. Okay. Um, well, hopefully, as long as they keep telling Wait. me every week I can write it. You know. I, I really enjoy it, and, and I think it's yeah. very important that there be a column like that weekly from the newspaper. I, I, I really... Uh, I remember when I first here, you used to have a Monday column that I thought was very good, and then you didn't have any, now you're back to it. Tell us a little bit about how you come up with, uh, when do you start in the week to work on a, on a column? Um, I suppose it depends what's going on, but kind of walk us through, and how much time do you spend on this? 
Well, some of the ideas I, I have for a couple of weeks okay. bouncing around in my head, will, uh, I'll just kind of get a basic idea okay. of a theme or a pattern for it. Uh, you know, I worked on the one from last week about uh, uh, Senator Sawyer yeah. and uh, the comparisons to, to uh, Senator Johnson. Yeah. Uh, I started doing some reading about that when it became uh, pretty clear that, uh, you know, the odds were that we were going to have a U.S. Senator from Oshkosh. Uh -huh. Um, I kind of stumbled upon the, the Phyllida Sawyer from uh, reading about Robert La Follette okay. yeah, and the, uh, the Progressive okay. Revolution. And I, I just had remembered that sliver of his meeting with Sawyer uh -huh. and how it took La Follette from uh, a pretty mainstream Republican in Wisconsin into being the Robert La Follette that people... Uh, I thought that was a perfect column the week after the election because the easy thing to do would be to write another column on the election. Instead, you come up with this sort of historical relationship that I bet no one thought about or knew about. Well, you know what it kind of reminded me of, <clears throat> and um, that was another one that you wrote. You know, you start out reading it, and you think it's going to be about Ron Johnson mm -hmm. until you get further into it. Mm -hmm. It's like the column that you did um, where you started it. It was on the mayor yeah. of Oshkosh, and, and we all kind of were led sort of to believe that it was Paul Esslinger, you were talking about, and at the end it turned out to be about none other than uh, our previous mayor. Mm -hmm. So, you know, yeah. it was just kind of, it, it reminded me of that yeah, a little yeah. bit. Um, if the fire truck shows up tomorrow night in the parade, will your column maybe on Sunday be about the fire truck? <laughs> too early to say? Or? It's too early to say whether or not we'll see it. Okay. And uh, I think that that issue finally had a pretty reasonable yeah. resolution. Yeah. Um, I don't think anybody ever thought that it wasn't an important part of Oshkosh history or memorabilia that shouldn't be preserved. Right. It was kind of the way it was done. It was a process. Mm -hmm. yeah. It was a process. Yeah. And I think it ultimately, um, it's, in, it's in good hands with the fire department. Uh -huh. um, and it would be nice to see it. It would be nice to see it. It would be nice to see it. You don't know where it is, do you, Cheryl? No. Okay. Right. No, I've had people tell me where they thought it was. Uh -huh. but I think it's I, in the main I, fire station. Main yeah. fire station. Yeah. Yeah. Um, do you intend to write a column on the mosque issue? I know that there have been a lot of letters to the editor, a lot of comments on mm -hmm. the, you know, attached to the stories that have been written on it. But now that this has been approved by the council as of, well, we're taping this, you know, the day after the vote was taken, uh, it won't show right mm -hmm. away until next week. But uh, do you plan to write a column on it? Um, it really hasn't been something that struck that, that uh, you know, um, we had written an editorial as an editorial board mm -hmm. uh, about right. just the, the way it's been handled and the community has a right to be proud of itself. Mm -hmm. um, I think it's a great non-issue to write about because I think things happen exactly the way they should mm -hmm. in a polite and civil society. Yep. Um, I thought... Well, some of it wasn't so polite. Well, you know, there... Uh, yeah. Yeah. But um, yeah. Most of it was, but there yeah. was some that was kind of ugly. Mm. Uh, I think overall it, it's... Uh, it was a zoning issue. Mm -hmm. uh, I thought I had great respect for Mayor Bloomberg in New York, who acted like a true conservative when the issue was raised and said it's a, it's a zoning issue for the yeah. city of New York. There's no reason for government to be involved in this. And I thought there are mm -hmm. still some conservatives left in the world who do yeah. want to get government off people's back mm -hmm. and not have government, uh, whether it's controlled by Democrats or Republicans, mm -hmm. be big government. Yeah, yeah. What do you see for surprises, if any, in the upcoming April elections for common council, mayor, school board? Are there any, any little signs out there yet of anything that may be going on or pretty empty? Or? Uh, so far, I think it's just chatter behind the scenes okay. of who's going to be running for office, okay. not running for office. Jessica King is the only person who's done a formal right. non-declaration of candidacy for council. Right. Um, I think people are just tired out of elections. Yes. I mean, we I just right. finished up an election. and Yeah, we don't want to um, go into February and April right away again. Don't want to do that. Yeah. I certainly don't. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I, I need a break from it yeah. all. Um, what, are, what are other things um, that might be coming up at the Northwestern that we can look forward yeah. to? Um, we're going to be uh, sometime next year unveiling a new website that we're working on currently to kind of take that to the next generation okay. to uh, to make it more user-friendly, more visual. So that's something we're <clears throat> working on. Um, 
you know, we, we always look forward to the uh, end of the year and the start of the year for the top news stories mm -hmm. yep. and the biggest things that have made an impact. I mean, I, I think we've, having a senator from Oshkosh is, uh, is going to be top of the list. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. Oshkosh Corporation, mm -hmm. not only with the contracts, but the uh, leadership change over there is going to be a big issue. Um, so there, there's a lot on, on tap. Your favorite Main Street, too, it's finished. Main Park. Street is finished, and uh, you know that's a, the thing where I think <clears throat> we can declare from government's perspective, mission accomplished, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and uh, now it's up to private sector and mm -hmm. businesses to, to make that happen, and to, uh, you know, the infrastructure is there, um, things that were laid out in the uh, late 90s, early 2000s for creating Opera House Square mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. are complete. Uh, one of the complaints was always that the sidewalks were not in good shape, that uh, you know, get the street redone. Mm -hmm. So I think it's really going to be up to businesses to make that happen now. Sure. So the new website um, early in the year? It'll be we'll in the that? spring it's planned for. Okay. Mm -hmm. Will one of the user-friendly changes, Jim, be, um, I, I know you've probably heard this, uh, we've heard it and I've personally experienced it. You go to look for a story and <laughs> it's, it's there under the, the headlines on your home page and then all of a sudden it's not there. Um, later in the day or the next day, it may be back there again, but the comments are gone. Um, I finally figured out that if you scroll down to, to news, click on that, and then you scroll down to the archive, you can go to the preceding day and find it, along with any comments that you may be looking for. <clears throat> but I think, by and large, that's one of the things that people really are frustrated with, and I'm sure, like I said, yeah, you've no, that, heard that's that. a, a good that's comment. That's one of the things thing, you're yeah. going to be looking at. I right, hope, definitely. Okay, good, good. Um, what else? We've got about a minute um, and a half or so left. Revenue up for the paper. I know the Gannett stock is up quite a bit. Since are things kind of economically turned around somewhat, a little bit for the newspaper? You know, for the newspaper industry, again, it's it's how the economy is overall. Yeah. I think that uh, people had hoped it at this point in time that the economic recovery would be taking much greater hold than what it is. Mm -hmm. So we are holding our own. Okay, good. All right, okay. Yeah. And with that, we are just about out of time. So yeah. thanks much. Okay. Tell Thank Stu you. hello. Yeah. We miss having him here, yeah. too. Yeah, bring him along he's, next time. He's doing all right, though? <laughs> yeah. He's doing good. Busy? Good. Keeping him busy, though, right? Yeah. He is he is very busy. <laughs> As are you Thanks all, I'm sure. Thank, thank you. So yeah. Thank you so yeah, much. You, Appreciate it. And that's going to do it for us. We'll see you next time. Until then, take good care. Keep your eye on us. We've got our eye on Oshkosh.